I could walk into any group anywhere of any age in any context, and I could almost guarantee I'm going to get pretty much the same answers. People are looking for love in some form, acceptance, belonging. They want to feel that people care about them. They're looking for happiness. They're looking for security, significance. Those are the things that people are looking for, but apparently they're not finding those things. I want you to keep in mind a few of those things that we mentioned, love, happiness, peace, security. Keep those things in mind. We're going to come back to those in just a second. But pretty much everybody in the world is looking for the same things. They just aren't quite sure where to find those things. And there's an ongoing search for who knows what in our culture, in our world, really. I was flipping through the channels the other day and, and came across the, the beginning of the, the movie from way back, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And at the beginning of that movie, they're looking for uh, a, a medallion, a headpiece that goes on a staff and it had a jewel in the center and some ins inscriptions around it, and it told uh, uh, the length of the staff to set this thing on, and when you came to the, the site where to dig, you'd put it in the ground in a specific place, and the sun would shine through it, and that beam would illuminate exactly where to dig for that treasure. Well, they finally got a hold of that thing, and they went to, to find it, and when they got there, they saw that the, the bad guys were already doing a dig, and they said, what's the deal? And one of uh, Indiana's associates uh, was there. He said, I saw they had one of these too. And he said, well, there's only one of them. What's the deal? And he handed him the piece and he looks at it and he goes, but there's only, those only had markings on one side. They said it was a fake. It was a counterfeit. This one has markings on both sides. And one side says, cut the staff to this high. And then you flip it over and says, and then take a couple feet off of that. And he said, they're digging in the wrong place. And that's what's going on with our culture. They've got missing part of the equation, and so their standard is skewed, and they're digging in the wrong place for these things. And it's not that the things that they're, they're looking for, it's not that the, the things that they're hoping to find are wrong, it's just that they're, they're not looking in the right place for these things, and they're trying to find them in, in ways that aren't healthy and aren't fulfilling. If you look at our culture, that's what you see going on. And those things that people are looking for, uh, look, at, look at the way our culture uh, goes after love or what they even call love. Look at the things they're doing to try to find happiness. Even, even the founding document of our, of our nation says we have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So why are so many people coming up short in that pursuit. You know, that message, that empty message is as prevalent as anywhere in our culture in music. And because music is kind of a universal language, it's really one of the best indicators of, of cultural values, whether they be good or bad. So I was kind of looking through a lot of different music uh, kind of at the outset of this message. And one of the songs I considered using and, and end up not using is one that was made popular uh, several decades ago by, by one of the uh, bands that's got probably one of the most enduring influences on pop culture, the Rolling Stones. And they have a song from several years ago that many of you recognize, and it says, I can't get no. All right. Now, all right. You shouldn't know that song. Right? And I'm not going to have you sing it, and I'm not, I'm not going to try to sing it myself. But to say this, let, let, me, let me have you listen to the lyrics of that song and see what they say. These great, profound lyrics. It says, I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. Because I try, and I try, and I try, and I try. I can't get no, I can't get no. Is that deep or what? <laughs> he goes on. I can't get no, oh no, no, no. Hey, 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 that's what I say. <laughs> Man, he wrote that. I can't believe it. I've been an editor and a writer for years. Man, if I could have found people to put words that profound to paper, I'd... Man. But seriously, I mean... It's, it's really a very puny message. There's really not anything deep or profound about it. But you got to admit it does get the point across. And the message is simple. I can't find satisfaction no matter where I look. And I've tried and I've tried. And everyone's trying. But like Mick Jagger, they can't find any satisfaction even though they've tried and tried 
and tried and tried. That song goes on in some of the verses and you look at it and it talks about the emptiness of materialism and advertising and TV and the media. And then another verse talks about the futility of fame and, and, and worldly pleasures. And in essence, that song kind of laid out uh, it's just an outline that came to me that said, you know what, people are looking for satisfaction, but they're not going to find it through information. They're not going to find, you could say that that maybe applies to education or social causes. We live in an information uh, society, and none of that's going to satisfy. You don't find it through imagination, which could be creativity or entertainment. It doesn't satisfy. You're not going to find it in image, which is popularity and status. You're not even going to find it in indulgence and sensuality or worldly pleasures. None of those things. And all of that just confirms what we considered last week, that nothing this world offers can completely satisfy. And all you need to do is look at the most successful and accomplished people, at least in worldly terms, to understand that nothing is going to satisfy. I want you to take a look at this excerpt from a 60 Minutes interview with the New England Patriots quarterback, Tom Brady. He's widely considered the, the, the greatest player of all time. And since this interview, he's won two more Super Bowls and married a supermodel. Most guides would say that he has, uh, he has it all. He has everything you could want. But I want you to hear what he has to say here in this interview. Look at it again here. This, signif this is significant. I want you to hear what this guy says, the guy who has everything. Well, I'll tell you, I, I, I know what it says. He goes on in that interview, and he sits down with Tom Brady, and he says three Super Bowls. He got three Super Bowls. He actually has five now. He's married a supermodel, and he says, you've, you've got it all. He said, did you ever dream that you were going to attain such, such heights? And he said, I, I never could have ever imagined that. And he said, do you, ever, do you ever sit and think when you look at all that you've accomplished? Did, do you ever say to yourself that, that there's got to be more? There's got to be more than all this. And pardon my language, but he looks at the person and says, God, I hope so. And he says, well, what do you think it is? And he says, I don't know. He says, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. And here's a guy who has everything in worldly terms, and yet he knows there's got to be something more. He just doesn't know where in the world to find it. Now, you can look at that and say, well, those are entertainers. Those are, those are athletes, but... These cultural icons have tapped into something that resonates with people of all ages and all nationalities because they're all searching, but they're not finding. They're all digging, but they're coming up empty because they're digging in the wrong place. So I ask you, is there any hope for people in this world to find the things that they're looking for? Can people's pursuit of love and happiness and peace ever reach a satisfying conclusion? That's where we come in. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Let's dig into the Word just a bit here and see what we find there. This passage talks about the fruit of the Spirit, which are the key character traits that God intends to develop in His people through the power of His Spirit. In the lives of those who follow Christ, this is he, what He wants them to become like. And I'm not going to put it up there, and, and I don't just want to read it to you. I want you to kind of recite with me these things that come up in this passage. Beginning in verse number 22 
of Galatians chapter 5. And it begins to, to list these fruit of the Spirit. And it says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and Okay, now at that one, you're going to get a few different things. Depending on what translation you have, you got peace, you got long-suffering, uh, you got forbearance. But we're going to stop there. I want to look just at those first three. Love and joy and peace. That sound familiar? What were the things that just a few minutes ago that we uh, said were the very things that everyone else is looking for? We said they're looking for love said they're looking for happiness. It sounds a lot like joy, only joy goes deeper. We mentioned security and significance. That sounds a lot like people who are trying to find peace, except peace is deeper. And I find it interesting that the very things that everyone everywhere is looking for, and they won't deny it, are the very things that God intends to bring about by the power of his spirit in the lives of people who follow him. In other words, we who know and follow Christ and have his spirit working in us, we already have what everyone else is looking for. They just don't realize it. But we know the source, and we've tapped into that ultimate source of love and joy and peace. But here's the irony of that situation. While people are looking here and there and everywhere for these things to find that love and joy and peace, the one source that so many people shun, that the, the one that so many people avoid is the one place that they could find these things, they just don't realize it. And so I ask myself, why? Why do they avoid it? Why can't people see it? And then I say, well, are they going to, can we really expect people to come to us to, to get it, to find it? And I look at what the Word says, and I have to say, man, how hard is it going to be for people to recognize the truth, even, even when it's right in front of them? Because the Bible says that the God of this world has blinded their eyes so they can't see it. And every one of us has been there. And in the Great Commission Jesus gave before he left the earth, did he tell us to be ready if and when people come to us? we got to be ready. we got to have things going on here. But that isn't the method he gives the approach that he gives is not to set up shop here and wait for people to come. Jesus tells us to take the initiative and tells us to go into all the world. And he tells us that we can do that in the power of his Holy Spirit. The same Spirit, by the way, that was the one who develops in us those things we just looked at in Galatians chapter 5. So if we have what everyone else is searching for but they just don't realize it, then doesn't that put a good share of the responsibility on us? Now, before I dig any further into that, I just want you to consider this. I'm going to back up and challenge you with this thought. If we already have what everyone else is looking for, then why would we look anywhere else for those things? Now, I'm not going to preach that tonight, but I just want to remind you of this thought. If you've looked into the Word, if you look at history, that was the issue that prophets and godly leaders address over and over and over again. Because God's people constantly looked at the cultures around them and got enamored with their way of life and walked away from God and decided to pursue their own ways. I mean, they had God's love, they had God's laws, they had His leadership, they had His, his power and His constant provision, and yet, they chose to shun all those things again and again so that they could imitate the cultures around them. Now, does that sound familiar? Sounds like what we're living in today. So if we've learned anything from their example, if we've learned anything from history, why would we look anywhere else for what God has already given us? Especially when that's the stuff that everybody else is already looking for. And on top of that, I have to ask myself, if we have what others need, then why would we be timid to let it show? We're not timid about a lot of other things. We're not timid about a lot of other views and things that we're into. But somehow we get hesitant when that topic comes up. And I'm not going to dwell on that either. I want to keep it simple tonight. I want to look at one thing. I want to challenge you with this thought. If we know that we already have what everyone else is looking for, then we've simply got to let it show. We've got to let it show so that the world doesn't have to strain themselves to see it. So they don't have to strain themselves by digging and digging and digging in the wrong place. Well, sometimes the church sits by and watches. The fact is that most people are never going to look into 
this place for their answers, even though this is where they're at. And nowadays, because of so many people, even in the church, are beginning to question the relevance and authority of this word, this definitely is not going to be the first place where most people look. And we know that they're not usually going to set foot in here to see what's going on here until they see what's going on here when you and I step out of this place. Because that's how and why they need to see it. It's not a matter of us drawing attention to ourselves, but when we live in a way where God's love and joy and peace are showing through us, then people are going to be attracted to Christ. They're going to begin to see him through us. John chapter 13, verse 35 says, Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. And 1 John 4, 17 says, This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. For in this world, we are like Jesus. So in other words, when they look at us, they should see what Jesus is like. And when they see uh, what he's like, uh, they're going to begin to understand love because he is love. He's the embodiment of it. In fact, that's what it tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, when it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God, and whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. He's the embodiment of love. That's the source that we know. He is the source of the love that people are looking for. So what about joy? They're looking for joy too. So what does it have to say about that? Some would call it happiness, but happiness tends to rely on circumstances. What's going on? This makes me happy. This doesn't. But joy goes deeper than that. In Luke chapter 1, when Mary just had the announcement of what would happen through her and the birth of Christ was, was coming, she said, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Psalm chapter 16, verses 11. 11, David says this, In your presence there is fullness of joy. In other words, anything else that even seems to resemble joy is going to be incomplete apart from God. Or a person will only know the full extent of joy when he knows the presence of God. So God is the source of more than happiness, but true joy. And God is the source of that love. Well, what about peace? The Apostle Paul begins several of his New Testament letters with the greeting, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the titles given to Jesus in Scripture is the Prince of Peace. John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus said this shortly before he leaves. He says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. That tells me that whatever kind of peace this world may seem to offer, there's nothing that's even to compare with the peace that I have through a relationship with Jesus Christ. So what do all those passages tell us? They tell us the same thing that the lives of countless people had followed Christ through the ages could attest. And that is that God is the ultimate source of all these things that people are so desperately searching for in life. Because the love that they're looking for is not going to be found in some illicit relationship. It's only going to be found through a relationship with the one who created us and the one who embodies love itself. And joy is not going to be found uh, in, in some way through, through wealth or, or the accumulation of possessions. Or some people try to find joy and happiness by avoidance. That's why they get addicted and hooked on things because they're looking to somehow escape the pain and think by default they're going to find joy. But it doesn't work that way. And there's no other place that we're going to find peace than the one who satisfies our soul and secures our life like Christ. Romans 5.1 tells us that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not a matter of just knowing that. You've got to experience it. It's not a matter of knowing about God or even believing what Jesus did. I don't know if you could hear or understand that last verse of that U2 song. This was the lyrics of the last verse. It says, I believe in the kingdom come, then all the colors will bleed into one. But yes, I'm still running. You broke the bonds, you loosed the chains. You carried the cross of my shame. He's referring to what Jesus did. You know I believe it, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Because you can know it, you can even believe it. The Bible says the devils believe. 
But have we received it? Have we surrendered to Christ? Have we determined to follow him? Because only through that personal relationship do we taste and see the goodness of God. And that's how we find that ultimate satisfaction. And once we've tasted, nothing else is going to satisfy. Don't let Satan fool you. Once you've known firsthand the love and joy and peace of God, you're not going to settle for anything less. We've been talking about the lies that, that the devil tells us. Well, the biggest lies he's been telling from the beginning, even with Adam and Eve, he convinced that, that somehow God was maybe withholding something from you, and you're missing out. And to the very end, he's going to be able to convince people that. After Christ comes back physically to this earth, and he reigns for a thousand years on earth, peace and perfection, what everybody has thought they always dreamed of, and at the end of that time, it says the abyss is going to be open and Satan's going to be loose and deceive the nations one more time. And you know there's going to be people who are born during that time who he's going to be able to convince that you are missing something. And they're going to follow the devil to their own destruction at the final battle of the ages. So don't be fooled. You're never going to find greater fulfillment in any other way than through a relationship with Jesus. John 10.10 10 is where it says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That's what people are looking for. And that's what people need to see in us. After all, who's got a better reason to love than we who have received the greatest love, an unconditional love, an eternal love? And who has more reason for joy than those who have been forgiven and set free? Those who have been redeemed from, from utter hopelessness and given the hope of heaven. Those who have been taken from being condemned criminals to children of the king. And who has better reason for peace than those whose soul has been secured and whose eternal destiny has been assured? Psalm 13, 5 says, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. Philippians 4, 4 says, rejoice in the, in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. How many times in Scripture it uses the term rejoice? Well, what does that mean? It simply means to, to let your joy out, to let it show. Helen Keller had every reason to be bitter in life. She felt cheated by life. She could have. She was blind. She was mute. She couldn't, she couldn't speak, she couldn't hear, and yet she refused to let those things define or defeat her. She wrote this. She said, resolve to keep happy, and your joy and you shall form an invincible host against difficulties. You keep your joy, and you and that joy are going to be a barrier against it. It doesn't mean it's going to insulate you from pain or hurt, but when those things come, they're not going to phase you because that joy is steady through it all. And those difficulties will come. Your love and your joy and peace are going to be tested by some tough things. But that's when those things really matter. That's when God proves that what he gives us is enduring and lasting. The enduring strength of love and joy and peace. Romans 8.35 says that nothing, no trouble, no hardship or persecution or danger can separate us from God's love. And more times than I can count in Scripture, it tells us that His love endures forever. It holds up for all time. 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. And verses 7 and 8 say this. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. That's the power. That's the strength of love. And we've all seen it. People will pursue. They will persevere. They will prevail through things that they never thought humanly possible when they're motivated by love. How much more when that love is God's love? And when you have God's peace and the assurance of eternity with him, there's not anything on earth that can shake your faith. What about joy? What strength comes from joy? Well, I'm glad you asked. Proverbs 17, says something interesting. It says a joyful heart is like health to the body. Who doesn't appreciate health? Some, some people would give anything for good health. We need health. We need strength physically and spiritually. Nehemiah chapter, chapter 8, verse 10. You know this passage of Scripture as soon as I read it. That's the one that says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Notice what comes first in that verse. It's the joy a lot of times I think we get that kind of mixed up and we think that somehow if we muster up enough, uh, enough spiritual fortitude and, and we grit it out and we persevere and we overcome and we're victorious spiritually and we do, do some great things, then somehow we're going to feel good about our walk with God and that will bring us joy. But that's backwards. 
The Bible doesn't say that we have joy because we're strong. It says that we find strength in the joy that we already have. And when we realize that, that, that we have a reason for joy, no matter what the circumstances, you're going to find the strength in Christ to prevail in any situation. And make no mistake, there will be situations that test your faith, that test your love and your joy and your peace. And that's when those things really matter. Remember at the start when I talked about the fact that most people are never going to find those things they're looking for, that they're desperately searching for until they see them in us? Well, they're never going to see our love, our joy, and our peace more clearly than when those things show through difficulties, than when those things are put to the test in our life. Because those are the unlikely situations when our love and joy and our peace can shine the brightest. I could talk about a lot of situations in which these godly traits are needed and necessary and when they come into play, but I only want to hone in on one particular type of situation as we draw things to a close. We consider how God's love and joy and peace don't really depend on circumstances, yet there are circumstances when those things are not only most important, but they're most apparent. And it isn't the times that you might think, because it isn't the time when we're just overwhelmed with joy, or we're overwhelmed with love, and we just can't help but to let it show. But the times when those things are most apparent, and when they're most vital, are the times when they don't come easy. There are times when we press through opposition and adversity, but we do so with a grace that defies all human reason and ability. That's when it becomes unmistakably clear to people around us that we have something real. That we have something that, that, that transcends circumstances and emotions. It may not even be something that shows uh, outwardly in, in some kind of a, a expression of enthusiasm, but in that calm contentment that comes from deep inside that can't be shaken by anything else or swept away by any of the troubles or the, or, or the trials or even the tragedies of this life. Because you see, when love really proves itself is when it's tested by opposition. When you follow Jesus' instructions from Matthew chapter 5, to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Or Luke 6, 27 says it like this. Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. That's not easy to do. But that's when love really makes a statement. That's when it really shines. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 26, Jesus says in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, most people have a skewed perception of Christians based on the labels that society has put on us. And you, you've heard them all. They look at us as, as hypocritical and judgmental and closed-minded and bigoted and intolerant and on and on. And all those things may be gross misperceptions, but that's the reality that we're up against. But you know what's going to begin to dispel those misperceptions and those opinions as much as anything? Is when we step out of this place and we go beyond these walls and we begin loving and serving and meeting needs for people who may never do anything but resist us in return. And when people see us helping the hurting and feeding the hungry and bringing hope to the hopeless, that's when people will begin to say, you know these Christians, I've heard a lot about them, and aren't they supposed to be all these bad things? But you know, as much as everybody else is talking about compassion and community, these guys are the ones who are actually out there doing it. And that's when they're going to rethink those stereotypes. And that's when they begin to open up to the message that accompanies those acts of compassion. And when we maintain our joy through heartache and sorrow and disappointment, that's when that joy shines brightest to those around us. That's when people who look at our faith, when it's tested by grief. And let me tell you something. Sometimes the people the most sincere about finding something that's real are going to put you to the biggest test. Some of the people who give you the hardest time in life that you think are so far from God, they're the most serious about finding something real. But before they, they give themselves over and begin to open up to what you have, they're going to put you to the test. And sometimes that's what's going on. And that's when the reality of Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7 hit home. And it tells us to rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, 
will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, people are going to begin to take notice when they see us endure problems and pain and persecution and we're still at peace, when we still maintain a joy, when they see us go through, through things that nothing else, no one else that they know can endure those things with such grace and gratitude. And that's what grace is, by the way. Grace isn't just mercy and love. Grace is an enablement to do things that we can only do with God. And when people see that, that's when they begin to realize that perhaps we really do have what they're looking for. One of the questions that's always going to come up when you see tough times come is, why do people suffer? Why does God allow that? Especially with people who are godly and, and they serve Him. Well, in a fallen world that defies God at every turn and goes their own way, adversity, suffering, disappointment, struggle are going to be the norm, and it affects every one of us. But I ask you this, who is better equipped to handle adversity? than followers of Christ. Who is better equipped to handle tough times than God's people? And perhaps the reason God allows His people to endure some of the toughest trials is not just to build our character and strength, not just to test our faith, not just to help us to develop dependence on Him, which it does all of those things, but I think He brings us through adversity so the world can begin to see that what they're really looking for is only found in those who follow Jesus. Because you see the love and the joy and the peace that God gives. They don't depend on circumstances. So the light is always there to be seen. But man, I'm telling you, there's no time when that light shines brighter and more apparent than when we face adversity. When we go through the dark and difficult times and we don't give up and we press through and they could see in us a joy that transcends anything that goes beyond what this world can offer. Listen, when people who've been looking for love and joy and peace in all the wrong places, when they see people like us who seem to have what they're looking for and we're able to hang on to those things no matter what the world throws at us, that's when the people who are sincerely searching the most are going to open their hearts to see that Christ alone is the source of our strength and our security, and our satisfaction. And I'm going to be really honest with you. In the days ahead, people are going to grow colder and more callous to our faith and our message. And they're going to reject you, and they're going to reject God, and they're going to reject His Word, and they're going to follow every deviant and defiant philosophy and lifestyle. And most of them are going to seem so far removed from ever being open to the gospel that we're going to be tempted to give up all hope of ever reaching out to them. But I'm going to tell you this. As long as the human heart is searching for a love that's eternal, is searching for a joy that can't be compared to anything else, as long as it's searching for lasting peace, those hearts are going to be susceptible to the message of Christ. But they've got to see His light burning in the lives of people who know him and have that love and joy and peace inside. But before they ever open their lives to that, before they ever even listen to the message, before they believe it, before they ever receive it for themselves, they need to see that message come alive in the lives of people who follow Jesus and know those things that he brings to us, who know those things that everyone else is searching for. And that may mean some tough times for some of us. But take heart because those tough times can't shake our faith. In fact, those tough times are faith's finest hour because those are the times that give our light an opportunity to shine like no other times can give. And those are the times in which people looking at us are finally going to see that's what I've been looking for. That's what I need. I want you to bow your heads with me as we close. The first thing I want you to think about is this. There may be people here tonight who are still in that search for that love and joy and peace that only Jesus can give. There's no other way you're going to find it than through the one who created you to have those things and to have them through a relationship with him. But for their very beginning, people chose to go their own way. That's basically what sin is. It's going our own way. It's obviously not the same as a perfect God's way. In fact, that sin is so contrary, it's so opposed to the nature of God that it requires the most extreme penalty. That's death, eternal separation from God. 
We'd just be getting what we deserve. We couldn't even pay the price ourselves because we'd just be getting what's come to us. But God loved us enough, said, I'm going to provide the solution. And he sent his son Jesus to live on this earth, to walk as a man, to experience all the trials that we do, to suffer these things, to, to, to walk and move and live as a man empowered by the Holy Spirit who provides this thing, who showed that love and that joy and peace. And he wants to give that to you today. Because when Jesus laid down his life, that was to make a sacrifice for your sin and mine. It was to pay that penalty once and for all. And all that's left for us to do is receive that sacrifice for ourselves. And if you're here tonight and you say, I need that love and joy and peace. I've been searching. I haven't found anywhere else. In fact, maybe you're here tonight and you've been one of those who walked away from it. And you can attest as much as anybody that nothing else will satisfy because you've looked in other places. If you're here tonight, I want both that category. You're either coming to the Lord for the first time or you're, you're renewing that commitment to receive his love and joy and peace and the forgiveness that he offers if you'll accept the sacrifice Jesus made for you. If you're doing that uh, tonight, I want to I wanna pray with you before we do anything else. So with other heads bowed, would you just look up as I scan across here? I, wanna, I want you to just to catch my eye, and I want to pray for you tonight. If you're making that commitment, you're going to say, Lord, I want you to forgive me of my sin and take control of my life. I want to live for you, and I want to I, I find what I've been looking for, and I want my life to serve the purpose that you created it for. If that's you tonight, I want to look around. I just want, want you to catch my eye, and then you can look back down again. If there's anybody here that I can pray, pray for to receive Christ tonight. I'm going to pray for chance I missed anybody. I saw a couple of people looking. If I missed anybody, I want to pray. And if the musician could just begin to, to play softly. I want to, you don't have to repeat after me. I'm going to pray for you. And if this is your prayer, if, you, if, you're, if your attitude and your prayer and your heart is, is saying these things to God, then he's going to come in and change your life and transform you. And he's going to fill you with his spirit, as the Bible says, that spirit that's going to begin to develop in you, that love and joy and peace. Lord, if there's people here tonight, They've been searching for that, or maybe they've known it, and they've walked away from it, and they definitely know they can't find anywhere else. If that's them tonight, I pray in this moment, as, as Lord, they're acknowledging to you their sin, and Lord, they're saying, forgive me. And Lord, they believe that you, Jesus, you died in their place, and you rose again with the power and authority to give them a new life, and they believe that in their hearts. Lord, you said if we do that, that you would come in, and you would forgive, and you would transform us, and you would change us from the inside out. And Lord, so if there's anyone here tonight who's praying that, who's asking for that, I pray you would give them the assurance that you have forgiven them in this moment, that you have placed your spirit in them. Lord, I, I, just, I work against any of the lie of the enemy that would tell them they're not worthy, that tell them that this simple commitment in this moment doesn't mean anything. It surely does because that's what your word says. If we confess that, you're, that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised from the dead, we'll be saved. And tonight they believe that. They're acknowledging that. And their sin is forgiven. And they're a child of God.